Dan, take it away. All right, everybody, thank you for coming to the July 28, the July 2020 SAN coordinator call. Put down your lemonade or not, either way, we're gonna have a great call today. Um, Cheryl, why don't you get us started? Great, thank you, Dan. Um, we're very excited to have this call today. This call has a lot of really important information to share. Um, and uh, our first two guests are really important and we're really glad that they could take the time um, to participate with us. Our first guest is Nancy Spector. She's with the National Council for State Boards of Nursing and Nancy has been such an incredible collaborator um, these last several months in talking about how do we prepare the information for our folks to do research about state requirements for nursing. So um, I'm gonna, I don't wanna steal her thunder, but I just want to underscore the great work that she has done in working with the state boards uh, with nursing and they have created a tool and you'll find it actually, it's, it's hyperlinked here, but you'll also find it on the homepage of the SAN website um, to get to the requirements. Um, also, I think I shared this with you all, but Nancy was one of the folks interviewed in a recent Inside Higher Ed article about how institutions are grappling with providing these professional licensure requirements. And so she was, um, she provided great insight in that article and we really appreciated that. Um, along with Cheryl Thompson, our other colleagues. So Cheryl Thompson and Nancy were tremendous in that article in sharing what the challenges are as we um, grapple with, um, with providing professional licensure notification. So Nancy, welcome. Um, uh, thank you for being with us today. Can you unmute yourself or would you like some assistance? Okay, am I unmuted? There you are. Okay. You sound great. I was muted. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, it's really a privilege to be here and to share some of the things we've done and the challenges we've had in um, navigating this new regulation from the U.S. Department of Education. And just as a little background, actually, Cheryl Dowd was the one that really helped us with this. It started back in January when the rule had just um, been adopted on November 1st. And so, you know, I had asked WCET, what do I need to tell the boards of nursing about this? Because our boards of nursing regulate all of the nursing programs around the country, and they kind of needed to know what was going on. So she was on a great webinar and explained everything to the boards of nursing about this new regulation, which the boards of nursing didn't know anything about, but they were, um, I think the U.S. Department of Education had not really done a great job of letting everybody know about this rule. So, but they are in, um, oftentimes in communication with all of their programs in the state. So I was hoping they would pass that word and the nursing programs would find out what they would have to do. So we that was in January and we came to February and, and we at NCSBN kind of talked about what should we do? Is this in our wheelhouse? Should we be doing anything to help the boards? And we kind of decided not really because this is really for the educators. So we really didn't do anything in February, which was too bad because then March and April happened. And as you know, that's when the pandemic started. So at this point, boards of nursing, we're beginning to hear from deans and directors. They were also very busy with the pandemic and all the clinical sites that were closing because of it, et cetera. But they were then hearing about this new regulation from their deans and directors. And then AACN, our um, American Association of Colleges of Nursing, contacted us and said, we really need help with this. Um, so we talked to administration at NCSBN and decided that really it is um, important for us to do something because if we didn't, then the boards of nursing would be getting um, a lot of inquiries from all of these programs. And we figured there's probably about 4,000 programs affected in this. So if you think about it, if the state of Illinois, they know their programs, for example, and if their curriculum is able, you know, they're able to license those graduates, but they don't know the curricula of all of the other programs around the United 
United States. So there would be no way they could determine and send a letter to all these programs saying, oh yes, your students can be licensed. So in, in really in May and June is when we started this project and um, we um, have something about distance education already online. So we developed something very similar. Uh, the distance education um, one tells them what requirements they'd need if they had students in other states. So we did the same thing for this, a drop down box. And um, what I had talked to the boards about is provide the least amount of information that these programs would need to know. What does the curriculum need um, in, in your state? What does it need to provide licensure for students from other states? Period. That's all you know. we wanted because we knew these programs um, they, have, they still have to go through the 50 states and they wouldn't want to go through a lot of information just to find what they needed. So what we received back, of course, was a conglomeration. Um, in some cases, it was the entire Nurse Practice Act, which is their law, which affects everything in the state um, for nursing. So there was a lot of back and forth with these um, boards of nursing on what would be the easiest thing for the programs to see so that they could determine if their students could be licensed in their state. So, in some cases, it was just, we, we after uh, they gave us a lot of different ideas, it was just that they had to graduate from a board of nursing approved school in that state. And that was it, that's all they had to write. In others, um, they needed a certain number of clinical hours. So, you know, they just needed to put that down as well as they all needed to graduate from a board approved uh, nursing program. More, um, the more complex things were that they needed to be substantially equivalent. For example, that was in Texas. They needed to be substantially equivalent to those programs. So then what the programs had to do is look at what their requirements are, and they had them very nicely spelled out and see if they met them all. So, um, you know, I think um, in the end, really we were able to provide the nursing programs with pretty much what they needed and at the, the very least amount of work we think that they need to do. Now, <clears throat> having said that, I keep getting emails from programs saying, we have to go through too much information. And you know, in some states, like if you do have to see if it's substantially equivalent, you do have to go through a fair amount of information. Some states, um, one in particular, just uh, they had to go through their attorneys before they would give us what they needed. And it did turn out to be a lot of the rules and regulations that everybody had to go through. So it wasn't as easy in a few states. But for the most part, I think the nursing programs could get through this, as I've told the nursing programs, in about a day and, and determine themselves if the students could be licensed in you know, all of those other states. What the programs would prefer, of course, and they have asked states for this, is for the state to provide them of a letter saying, yes, your students could be licensed in our state. But again, there's 4,000 programs that would be involved, and that would just be impossible for the boards to do, especially when they don't know what those um, curricula look like. So we did develop some FAQs that we have on that same web page that specifically says that um, the question is, can the Board of Nursing write you a letter of determination? And we just said no. Um, they can't. They need to go to the website um, and figure out if they determined that their students could be licensed there. And part of this, at the very beginning of all of this, we um, wanted to have a meeting with the US Department of Education, but they were too busy. It was during the pandemic. So they said, send us your questions <clears throat> and we'll answer it. So one of the things we did ask was, who needs to make this determination? We were hoping they wouldn't say, yes, the boards need to do this. And they absolutely did not. They said it is the, up to the programs to look at that information and to make that determination. So we do have the US Department of Education um, or, you know, behind us in that, because obviously there, it would be so easy for the programs to send out letters to 50 states and then they'd know and that's it. Um, wouldn't be as easy for the boards of nursing. 
Now, um, in the end, I think we have provided a lot of the very important information that the programs need. And when you think about it, really a student going into a program should know if they, they might not always live in that state, if they could be licensed in another state. Sometimes you don't know your future and where it'll bring you. They probably should know this. This should probably have been done um, for a long time. So I think right now getting it going has been very, very difficult. Boards of nursing get lots of inquiries as well as I know the programs are busy. But I think down the line, it, it probably is a good thing. So that's all I have on that from my end. Um, I don't know, um, Cheryl, do you want to have questions now or at the end? Or Well, it, I, I think that it would be a great idea, if you don't mind, to, uh, to answer questions that people may have about the tool or what you did to sure. put it together. Um, does anybody have any questions? You may unmute yourself or put, your, put the question in the group chat. Um, while you're while you're thinking of your questions and about to put it in the group chat, I have to say, when I look at this tool, this is what I use in my head, and I've shared this with other folks about um, a model of uh, what we are hoping that we can see from other national associations of state boards. And I am fortunate that I'm going to have a call with um, accounting actually uh, tomorrow. And I hope to be able to continue to move through these national groups, some of which have been really helpful, honestly, um, through, the, through the pandemic because they've shared COVID-19 guidance too. So we've made some you know, communications that way. Um, so we are really hoping that um, ultimately what we're going to be able to do is to provide you all with the National Association's link and then you can get to the state requirements because, you know, folks have asked us, well, can't you just develop one large compendium of all the requirements? Well, I don't speak nursing. I don't speak accounting. You know, it would be really great if the subject matter experts, you know, like nursing, like what Nancy's doing, you know, put it together. So um, this is a really helpful tool, and I'm really hoping that other um, professions will embrace this this um, this way of doing things. Here's a question for you, Nancy. Um, the NCSBN. Uh, Licensure tool on the web page provided in the agenda, the tool says, is for RNPN and APRN only. Uh, forgive this question if it's silly. No silly questions. Um, as I am not a nursing person, but what about other programs, BSN, for example? Okay, well, <clears throat> RN programs encompasses um, ADN, diploma, and BSN programs. So it's really any um, any nurse, you know, if they're a practical nurse, if they're an RN or if they're an APRN, any nurse that needs a license or certification to practice. So it's it's really just everybody. Great, thank you. Matthew says thank you as well. Um, those of you that haven't seen it, I put it in mix uh, about a month ago, I think. But Nancy author was one of the authors of uh, a wonderful article. It was from 2018, I believe, um, that really showed how um, licensure and accreditation and testing, you know, come together um, for a, a student to then be able to be licensed. And so it's a really great article. And I'll make sure that that's posted again on our website. Um, Nancy, I was telling you, I'm a fan of that of that article um, because it mm -hmm. really was a great um, way of explaining it to someone um, you know, how all of these converge. So, um, oh, here we have another question. Right. What does board approved program mean? For example, our program is approved by the North Carolina Board of Nursing, this institution's in North Carolina. When my nursing professors read board approval on the Alabama Board of Nursing website, they think that our program is okay in Alabama, but I read the exact same thing and think that we have to be approved by the Alabama Board of Nursing, who is right. Wow, you know, that is very helpful. That question is very helpful to me. I will change that. It does mean what your what your other professors say. They just it just has to be approved by the North Carolina Board of Nursing and then they're good in Alabama. And that's why that one is so simple and easy. As long as um, your own Board of Nursing approves you, then you're good in all of those states. But I'm going to redo that wording, I think. So thank you for that question. That is a really huge question, Steve. I'm so glad you asked that because 
Um, Nancy, you sharing that is gigantic so that if the institution, the state of the institution is approved by their state board, then you're saying that the other states will accept the approval of the state yes. where the institution is located. Yes. Wow, that, that's really right. good information. Right. And that's what we try to encourage all of the states to do. You know, states, uh, the regulators, what they want to do is put all of their whole practice act down and all their rules and everything. But really, I said, if it just comes to this, you will get fewer questions. And so many of them did do that. Um, and somebody asked, how often will it be updated? Um, we will begin to update in six months. And basically what we will do is um, email out to the boards to see if they've made any changes. But I will tell you, boards don't often make changes um, in this um, area. So I don't expect a lot of changes to be made. That's a good question. And, and as we've shared, and Nancy, if, if you could address this, you know, what I'm going to say as a statement is what we've shared with our institutions is that um, they want to make periodic reviews of what they do, but also date stamp it so that they can indicate that as of this date, you know, we have made this determination. So, and then go back and then they review from um, periodically. Yes. And, and there's a question about it's just for licensure. Um, for example, Alabama has extra requirements for offering courses in their state. And you are absolutely right. This is just for licensure. So it's somebody that would um, maybe graduate from a school in another state and then want to take the NCLEX in Alabama or graduate from a school in another state and then want to endorse into Alabama. Um, but it isn't for if programs want to do distance education and have their students in Alabama. So you're right. Oh, here's another good question. Um, it, it, it has to do with how you've indicated that the, the board in a state approved the program. Yes, Nancy speaking specifically to nursing. Mm -hmm. So unless we get that confirmed by other professions, um, you know, I would say that what we're sharing today is specific to nursing. Right. Well, let's see, many of the other professional boards list accreditation by certain organizations or memberships in professional organizations as synonymous with meeting educational requirements. Has there been discussion with the nursing community to simplify their requirements similarly? Oh yeah, well, there's certainly been discussion by um, some of the outside areas to nursing, but you know, we see board approval as very different from accreditation. Certainly the boards encourage accreditation, and I believe it is now 31 boards of nursing that require accreditation in their states, but because the state really um, has the pulse on the community of where those programs are located, um, doing program approval is, is very important in the states. So there has been discussion, but probably not as much within the boards of nursing and even faculty. Oftentimes in states where they have removed um, the approval, the legislators have stepped in and done that. This happened in one state. Faculty actually came down and really went to the legislators and said, we really think we need approval. And so in that state, um, again, the authority was given back to the board of nursing. So it is a very different mission. And, and it's interesting, Nancy, you all addressed that in the article that I was referring to. Right. Okay, so I'm going to take one more question. Um, do some states require additional courses like geriatrics prior to licensure in their state that would not be required in the state where they are originally licensed? Nobody requires additional courses. They all require um, content and things like medical surgical nursing, pediatrics, OB, um, mental health and community, um, but not specific coursework. And uh, Yolanda asked me about the article they referenced. Yes, it's in mix already. So you can go back and mix because I, you know, as I've shared with you all, mix is a resource. You can go back and uh, go into the link that I have there at the top of the agenda and you can see our previous discussions, but I'll also put it out again because it's a great article. Um, it really explains the basics of putting together accreditation, um, the uh, board approval and testing. So um, 
Nancy, thank you so much for being on our call today. This was fantastic. Um, you've shared great information. I, I know that our um, participants on the call are really grateful that you're here today. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, so that was one muddy area that we do in our jobs, and I'm going to move to another muddy area, um, you know, now that we've uh, heard a lot about nursing and, and professional licensure, but international compliance is another area that we are all very challenged with, and I have to say, we have been very blessed um, to have interactions with Hogan Lovells over these last few years. So if you look on the SAN website, on the... Um, on the topic area of requirements outside of reciprocity, you'll see the international compliance section. And the resources that we provide are actually from um, presentations and articles written by um, our friends at Hogan Levels. And uh, they have a service and they are very responsive to us and I'm really grateful for our interactions. Um, Greg couldn't be with us today, but Bill's here with us today. Bill, thank you so much for being with us today. And we're gonna specifically talk about the tax implication that arose recently, because um, we were talking about students who are physically located outside of the United States and tax implications. The one that came up had to do with Mexico, but um, I'm gonna turn it over to you as I don't, so I don't complicate the issue more. Um, Bill, thanks so much for being here. Sure, Cheryl. Hopefully you can hear me. There's yes. a lot of bandwidth uh, at my house here, but I have two kids uh, streaming video content, <laughs> so um, <laughs> hopefully I'm coming through. Well, you sound great. So um, I'm going to turn it over great. to you. Thank you. Good. Fantastic. Good. So I'll say a little bit about me and my practice uh, and then jump right into some of the um, more complex uh, regulatory and tax issues that we've been addressing uh, in the international online education uh, area. Uh, so as, um, as Cheryl said, I'm an attorney and partner in the higher ed practice of Hogan Levels, which is a large global law firm. Um, and I lead most of the firm's international work for US universities. So uh, over the past 20 years or so, that's been just the, the range and the spectrum of, of university activity outside the US, uh, whether it's a, a branch campus in China or a um, research collaboration in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, or a study abroad program in Europe uh, and everything in between from international student recruiting to offices and employees abroad. Uh, and nowadays, uh, employees abroad often means um, remote telecommuting, remote work sort of arrangements uh, for folks who are kind of stuck outside the U.S. and, and really can't make it back into the, into the states or back to campus, uh, which presents its own pretty complicated um, issues. So ne needless to say, the, these are very, very interesting times to be a lawyer uh, in the higher education uh, sector. Uh, you know, challenging, uh, a really difficult and new novel issue sort of arises every day. Um, the, 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 the question that, you know, campuses are struggling with, uh, and that's keeping the Office of General Counsel very busy, uh, is of course, you know, whether and how to open this fall. And um, as, as leadership thinks about all of that uh, and, and various ways to serve domestic students, uh, obviously, the, the topic of international students arises, and, and, and we all know uh, that, that those students who are based, who, are, who make their homes outside the U.S. are, by and large, many of them not going to be able to make it to campus this fall. Uh, some may be um, you know, new, newly admitted students um, who will just not have U.S. visas in time to be on campus. Others um, just cannot return due to travel restrictions or guidance to remain at home. Uh, and several schools are fully online this fall anyways, so no, no good reason to come to the U.S., even if you could anyways. Um, and this involves both graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, I think graduate students present a more difficult uh, set of issues because many graduate students receive stipends uh, from universities for, um, for all, all sorts of academic uh, services um, that are usually core to the academic experience, but is still services that can sometimes make them appear like um, employees. Um, so obviously the, 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 the regulatory question that's coming up across universities is, you know, as, as we transition everything online internationally, uh, the, the, the regulatory question is, is whether and to what extent um, the, the 
uh, foreign jurisdictions um, are are accepting or hospitable uh, to the school providing these online education, sometimes full degrees and sometimes just partial um, courseware uh, into that foreign country. And that's something that we as a firm have been focusing on for quite a long time. And it is it is it is a very tricky issue for a number of reasons, and and we'll get to as Cheryl said the the, the tax issue, uh, but but just to tee up the some of the broader issues, uh, th th this is tricky in, in large part because there is just so much country to country variation in the regulatory regime that applies to online education, not just online education, but education in general, but certainly with respect to online education and recognition of, of degrees outside the US. Um, obviously in the US, higher ed is, is very highly regulated, but outside the US, that is, that is definitely the case. Uh, but even more so outside the US, this is a highly political area uh, it, it's a body of law, it's a body of regulation that's often controlled at a very central government level. And it can be painfully bureaucratic trying to get answers or trying to get anything um, uh, through the, the Ministry of Education system. Um, so j just just providing these online courses abroad can, uh, can be uh, complex. You might be stepping into something you didn't expect uh, unless you've carefully navigated these issues, and it, I think we're all generally familiar with the types of education regulatory and authorization sorts of issues that could potentially arise outside the U.S. But that's, of course, just one sort of one sliver of, of the equation here when you're going to be beaming U.S. courseware into a foreign country as part of a student's degree program. Um, you, you, you run into tax issues, which we'll talk about. You run into consumer protection issues. You run into significant uh, global privacy, d data privacy issues, uh, funds transfer issues, um, internet connection issues, um, and, 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 and more. Um, and speaking of internet connection issues, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Federal Acquisition Regulation Council, which is the, uh, the, the body that produces government contracts, e U.S. government contracts clauses, um, just issued some some new rules that are making it very tough, uh, particularly in China, uh, for, for U.S. schools to facilitate, uh, a, a, you know, a proper VPN access that circumvents the the China firewall um, for purposes of accessing, you know, a, a Google-based university email account or a, um, a the, the, the normal university courseware uh, online. Um, so that's that's a, a separate topic for a separate day. Um, why don't why don't we jump into some of the the tax related issues? Um, and I should emphasize that you now often you can make a distinction between a, what what might be a temporary online course that's made available abroad during the COVID crisis versus a, a full online degree program that's made available abroad. Um, and and that's an important distinction. Um, and and you t typically for a full degree program, you're gonna run into all sorts of additional barriers related to marketing the program and advertising a program abroad, student admissions issues and accreditation issues. Um, but when it comes to the tax issues, I, I, I think these tax issues are going to apply um, and they're going to be triggered regardless of whether this is a temporary program or a, a more longer term, potentially full degree program. Um, uh, so the distinction, um, while it re remains important, I think you're still going to run into the same sorts of um, tax issues. Um, and, and just to describe the tax issue, um, it, it certainly, I think, merits a more in-depth and, and fact-specific discussion for each specific school. Uh, but very generally, a, a foreign tax issue may arise in online programming because services from the U.S. are being provided to a recipient of those services in the foreign country. The student is the recipient. And so there's a financial transaction there because the student is in many cases, in almost all cases, p paying for that, for that service. Uh, and whether we consider these services education services or electronic services or digital services or something else, um, and, and, and even if all these services are provided from outside the foreign country, from the, from the US, uh, tax may still be levied given that 
the location of the, the, the receipts of those services is in the foreign country. So foreign tax may be levied on, on payments the students make for, for that educational service. And that tax could be in the form of a value added tax, a, a VAT tax. It could be a, a quote unquote digital services tax um, or, or something similar. Um, so a number of countries um, have very recently announced taxes, um, not targeted directly at online education, but targeted more broadly at taxing the digital economy. Because the digital economy is incredibly lucrative. Um, companies like Google and Netflix and Amazon, of course, making billions of dollars off the digital economy and, and, and countries are looking for way to, ways to tax that revenue. Um, and so we, we, we get into you know, some pretty complicated questions here um, about to what extent does, does some sort of tax apply? Is it a digital services tax? Is it something else? Um, and the logistical issues around how a, a U.S. institution, which has no presence in that foreign country and certainly no people or agents there to, to remit a tax, would actually do something like that. So let me just spend a minute or two on, on the, the Mexico tax uh, and maybe even mention the India tax as well. Um, all of these, the, the, these the, both countries uh, in, in the past six months have come out with basically their, their, their method of taxing the digital economy. Um, and unfortunately, university online programs are caught up in this mix. Um, th these are largely known as digital services taxes, um, and they are um, not, not just you know, India and, and Mexico, but th these sorts of taxes are either passed or on the verge of being passed in Brazil and across the EU, including Italy and Spain. Um, Indonesia, uh, Turkey, and, and many other countries. Um, and in fact, there's been a uh, there's an investigation underway by the by the U.S. Trade Representative, because the the theory is that these were taxes designed specifically to hurt the U.S. economy or to hurt the big U.S. Uh, technological giants like like Google and Netflix and, and Amazon. Um, so that that's underway, but in the in the, in the meantime, these taxes apply. L let me just talk about Mexico for a moment. So, so Mexico recently introduced um, uh, a new 16 percent, one six, 16 percent value added tax on digital services, and the tax is effective on June 1st of this year. Um, and, and under that tax regime, digital services, which would include distance learning uh, services. Um, uh, which are which are you know, uh, delivered through like an, an internet application or through a network um, are essentially subject to this 16% tax if the receiver of the service is located in Mexico. And the law considers a receiver of the service to be located in Mexico if here the student has expressed um, uh, an address uh, that is located in Mexico, or if the student has expressed like a like a telephone number that is a Mexican uh, telephone number, um, and so you as a foreign as a non Mexican university need not have any place of business in Mexico uh, for this tax to apply. Um, it, it would apply, and it would require the the, the non Mexican institution here, the U.S. institution to essentially register with Mexican tax authorities um, uh, to offer um, or, or to build in the 16% value added tax and communicate that information to both the student and to authorities uh, to calculate uh, the monthly amounts uh, that the tax um, uh, adds up to uh, and essentially issue an invoice to the student that complies with uh, certain requirements. Uh, that, that, that reflects the value added tax. And it would also suggest that you would have to have a legal, uh, a legal representative in Mexico, somebody who you appoint in Mexico to oversee all of this and handle the, the, the tax filings. Um, so this is, this is a very new law. Um, it is already causing a lot of problems for, service, for, for digital service providers into Mexico, and that includes uh, US institutions. Uh, the, the law is very broad um, and, and clearly could apply 
uh, to tuition that a, that a, that a non-Mexican university uh, receives uh, from from online programming provided into Mexico for, for use and for receipt by the Mexican student. Um, th this is where, of course, some lawyering is going to come in because there's any number of ways to try to take the position uh, that these sorts of U.S. university online courses into Mexico uh, should not be uh, covered by the law. Uh, and then that requires not just a fact-specific analysis of, of your particular programs, um, but also a, a real dissection of the, of the Mexican tax regulation here to determine where the weak spots are uh, and, and where there is opportunity to push back against Mexican tax regulators who might take the view that as a broad matter, the law is broad enough to capture the U.S. university programs. Um, so that's, that's the Mexico situation. I mean, there's, you've probably heard that India has a very, very similar uh, tax. Um, and there are some similarities and there are some differences, but you know, there are, of, co of course, tons and tons of students in India who are uh, registered and admitted at U.S. universities who will be taking uh, uh, online courseware from India delivered by the U.S. institution. And back in April of this year, India announced what it called its quote-unquote equalization levy. Uh, and the equalization levy is essentially a, a 2% tax uh, on the payment received by a non-Indian um, online service provider. Um, and they have some terms here, uh, but the, the terms are broad enough to capture uh, any entity that is charging an Indian person for online digital services. Um, and then you know, the, 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 for, for the India one, the, the, there are some there are some thresholds. For instance, the tax wouldn't kick in unless the the digital service provider is uh, earning uh, approximately two crow, or that's you know about in U.S. dollars um, somewhere somewhere between 150 and 200 thousand uh, dollars in a tax year from the students uh, in India. So there are some thresholds before which it applies. Um, but there are plenty of schools that are above that threshold already, uh, given the volume of students they have uh, in India. Uh, but once again, you know, this is again where some lawyering comes in because there are the, the way that that tax law is written uh, suggests that there are possible ways to get around this, both in the way you design the program uh, and in the way you administer the program and in the options you make available to the student in terms of not just online programming, but potentially on ground uh, components associated with the same degree. Uh, so, so one might be able to argue that, well, this is not a wholly online program and therefore we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be uh, subject to the law. So it's, it's, it's those sorts of um, uh, arguments um, and, and creativity that would have to go into not just designing the program to uh, try to lawfully circumvent the law, uh, but also in, in, in administering the program uh, and, and putting in, I think, enough safeguards and safety valves to ensure that should uh, you know, the, tax, the tax man come knocking in India, uh, you'll have a, a, a reasonable basis to assert the view that you had no obligation to pay tax. So th that is just a, an overview primarily on, on the tax front. Um, there's just really no one-size-fits-all solution to these issues, and I think these are going to continue to be difficult issues uh, as more and more online programs proliferate and as more and more countries decide to enact these sorts of tax laws designed to capture the, the big uh, technology companies um, but are broad enough to capture really any any um, uh, digital service provider. So let me stop there. I, I imagine I've, I've confused uh, everyone. Um, so maybe there are some questions and uh, Cheryl, please feel free to um, to ask questions or to push a little bit more. Great, thank you very much. This has been very helpful. Um, something we've tried to communicate with the members over a period of time is that um, providing uh, dis the online courses outside of the United States has its own issues to manage. 
Um, just like uh, pre-SARA, um, states varied. Well, those of us who are in California, my California friends here that are on the call, they still are doing state-by-state -state compliance. But of course, um, so they understand how um, jurisdictions vary and so countries vary as well. Something I just wanted to point out, I'm glad you said that it's where the, um, that the student was located in Mexico because the way this came up is we were, um, somebody asked a question about receiving um, information from some third party who wanted to help an institution, but indicated in the note in the notice to the institution um, Mexican students. So it didn't it wasn't clear where the student was located or whether their um, whether their um, um, whether they uh, they were a student who was Mexican living in the United States or you know what the, where they were located it wasn't structured in that way um, we have some some questions here um, so was the Mexico VAT tax being enforced on June 1 was it effective June 1 or is it going to be effective uh, June 1 2021 it is effective on June 1st 2020 okay. so last month so it, it is already effective um, we, I am not aware that um, a Mexico tax authority has, has yet taken an enforcement action, um, which is to say that they, they, haven't, uh, <laughs> they, they haven't identified yeah. any non-compliant folks just yet, only because I think this is such a new, a, a new law. Uh, but I imagine if we have this conversation you know, in six months, uh, we, we could be having a very different uh, discussion. So our next question is, um, they're asking, is there a third party that would be helpful to work with uh, to manage this? They're, the institution's wondering, what is the next step that universities should take? Yeah, well, it, it, I, I don't think a third party is going to solve your tax problem. Um, if, if, if the, if the um, if, if, you, if by third party you meant, um, you know, it should, should we work with a Mexican university, for instance, to um, um, to, 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 to provide these online courses or should we have more of a collaborative relationship with a third party in Mexico or elsewhere to, to handle this? Um, I, I don't think that will necessarily solve the, the, the tax problem, although again, everything will be very fact specific. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, if, if, is there some sort of third party that could offer guidance? Uh, yes, yes. I, I think for any of these countries in which you're going to be purveying online programming, uh, I think it's it's critical to ensure that before you do that, you have a full handle on on the authorization and regulatory, uh, education regulatory requirements in that country, the tax requirements in that country, the privacy requirements, uh, the internet connectivity uh, issues that, that could arise, uh, especially in a place like China, um, and a handful of other things, uh, for example, uh, whether uh, uh, payments can actually be received or go, go across borders from a student in that country to your institution without it being a, a massive uh, hassle. Great. Um, just to, to clarify, when we talk about in-country, we're also considering U.S. territories and protectorates, correct? As being in-country just like a state? Yes. Ye yes. So I, I, I would consider those territories to be Part of the United States, uh, unless from a legal perspective, uh, they they have a different legal regime. Okay. Which, like Puerto Rico, for instance, uh, w would not. Okay. For for these purposes. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, one of our our folks wants to know if uh, you might be able to point us to the law in Mexico because the institution wishes to share it with their general counsel, so their general counsel can review. Would you happen to have access sure, to that? We, sure, sure. We we have a um, yeah. We, we we can link up to that at, at some point. I'm happy to forward that along. Okay, that's great. So to answer that question, um, look to the SAN website. When I post the uh, agenda and the recording, we will post the link to the regulation itself. Um, yeah. Let's see. And Cheryl, let me just amend one thing I said earlier. From, from a Puerto Rico standpoint, I want to be careful. I mean, Puerto Rico's tax regulations are very different from U.S. federal tax regulations. So I, I think when you're dealing with, if you're dealing with students, for example, in, in a place like Puerto Rico, uh, I, I do think it's a separate tax analysis from your typical U.S. tax analysis. Uh, but, but by and large, um, in terms of other U.S. federal laws, 
they typically apply to to uh, Puerto Rico. Okay. Uh, a couple of folks want to know if there is anywhere where we can find like what countries are requiring this kind of digital services tax? Is there any kind of list anywhere? Do we know, is this a, a, comp, is this a, a large number of, con, of countries that do this? Is it a small percentage? You know, how, how can we, you know, try to get to the heart of that? Yeah, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of a of a general list that exists somewhere online that will advise you as to whether a country has a digital services tax. And even if such a list existed, I don't think it would tell you whether it would apply to your particular program um, at issue here or whether there's a way to adjust your program, maybe even slightly, to lawfully circumvent or avoid such taxes. Um, so, the, I mean, the, the, the only way to really get at that um, is to take some local advice, whether that's uh, your local legal advice or local uh, accounting firm advice um, or other local advice um, that, um, that, that can guide you a bit as to whether the, the tax, even if it's there, uh, applies and, and how you can adjust the program to try to get around it. Great. Um, before we, we close up, that was the last question. Could you tell folks a little bit about, uh, you know, I've posted uh, a link to the service and um, that you all have for international um, uh, higher education. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Folks might be interested. Absolutely. I appreciate that, Cheryl. So, I mean, we at uh, Token Levels over the past few years have sort of anticipated uh, some of these really tough issues that are coming up on a country by country basis for online uh, programs delivered into those countries. And we created a, a new tool uh, and we call the tool the international, um, the Education Goes International Service. Um, and this is essentially a web-based platform that addresses for uh, almost 25 countries um, everything we just talked about and, and a lot more. Um, so it, it covers the sort of the waterfront of issues that you as an institution and, and that your general counsel uh, and that your, you know, your provost and others would, would need to take into account uh, and, and laws, uh, including tax laws that you would have to comply with in order to deliver an online program into that country. Um, so it, it covers, um, you know, the, it covers everything from, from education, regulatory and authorization issues to privacy issues, to tax issues, um, to internet connection issues, uh, to marketing type of issues and consumer protection issues and so on. And we do that for all of the, the typical uh, countries, uh, the countries that are most um, uh, the likely recipients of these services like China and India and uh, many of the, the EU countries and Vietnam and South Korea, uh, a few countries in Africa as well, many countries in the Middle East too. Um, Brazil, for instance, and South um, in South America. So um, it, it covers, I think, a number of the countries, and it, it's worth a look. Uh, I, I think uh, a number of, I'd say, not just a number, I'd say the dozens of schools over the past few um, months have found that to be a very useful and helpful resource. So I'm happy to provide more information at, at any point. Thank you very much, Bill. We link that actually on our website as well. Um, you all can find that in the topic area, as I, as I indicated before, about um, uh, requirements that are outside of reciprocity. We have, you know, obviously we have a number of requirements outside of um, reciprocity that you may want to review. Um, so, Bill, thanks so much for being on the call today and answering these questions and giving us, uh, you know, I, I know that it's a much more complicated topic that 20 minutes really doesn't cover all of it, but you gave a great overview and direction for next steps. So thank you so much for providing that for us today. My pleasure. Okay. So. We got to a lot of meat of things today. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. Um, thanks you all for, for listening carefully to all of this and I'll let, let Dan take it from here.
Well, Cheryl, I think I think on the agenda here, I think you're up again here with the in-person, same quarter in-person meeting. Okay, a lot of stuff going on today, isn't there? This is a big meeting. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, the, as you may have gathered, the WCET annual meeting uh, was going to be an in-person meeting in Indianapolis in October. Unfortunately, given everything and, and what we're seeing from a lot of um, of different conferences and workshops, um, that is moving to a virtual format, which means that our SAN coordinator annual in-person meeting will not take place. Um, we are still in discussion of what we want to do um, if we want to have a virtual uh, SAN coordinator meeting. Um, we have these monthly. Uh, the purpose that we had was to be able to have something in person. So we're still debating, you know, what the best format for that is and talking with our SAN advisory group. Um, we'll be having a meeting shortly um, about how we want to move forward with that. The original idea I had hoped um, was to celebrate the fact that we have just entered SAN 10. Um, the 10th birthday actually doesn't occur until March. So um, we could celebrate in the spring in person, hopefully, um, but uh, we will not be able to have an in-person meeting in the fall as we had hoped. On a brighter note, um, we are, as I said, we're working on that, but we're also working on our basics workshop. Um, we have our registrants uh, for the workshop. We are only doing half capacity. Um, for that in a virtual format because we're going into new territory because we want it to be those of you that have attended our basics workshop before know that it's meant to be very interactive and personal um, you know to the attendee so we are doing it in a virtual format uh, we still have our four mentors um, but we are just having a much smaller group um, and doing it through um, through primarily zoom but other um, other tools as well. So we're looking forward to that and it will be um, something that we'll be able to learn from um, to be able to see what kind of uh, opportunities we're gonna be able to, um, to also do later on. For uh, example, it is still our intention to have um, an advanced topics workshop in early 2021. That will be virtual. We know that people's um, uh, travel accounts have been um, either cut in half or slashed or taken away. So we know travel's challenging. So we are going to create something that's virtual for an advanced topics workshop um, in early 2021. We're gonna take our lessons from this basics workshop um, for format, plus WCET is using some new tools for the uh, virtual seminar series that you'll see at the bottom of the agenda here. Um, so we'll take lessons learned and create a really good advanced topics workshop uh, in uh, the winter, as well as this basics workshop that's coming up in September. Um, another good piece of news is those of you that have been on the SAM website, and I hope you go there often because that's where we have um, notices of new events, uh, you'll notice a new search bar at the top of the page. Uh, that search bar is a couple weeks old. And uh, there's always been search in, um, in the resources, but this is something that's actually accessible directly from each page. So you can use um, the SAN search bar now, and I hope that that uh, helps make some of your um, search easier um, as you look for things. And I appreciate those that have shared that that was something that they desired, and I'm glad that we were able to make it work. So um, that's what's coming up. Additionally, I want to point out two items under the announcements. Um, we have open forum in uh, just a few weeks and our next or, uh, open forum experts are Lori Williams and Marianne Boki. These are our good friends from NC SARA. Um, they will be answering your questions about NC SARA 2020. There have been you know, some changes as we know to um, section 5.2 of the policy manual and other new updates that uh, you may be able to ask your questions of Lori and Mary Ann. So we hope you'll join us on the second Tuesday of the month. And then of course we have a professional licensure notifications um, webcast on August 20th. You can register for that. Uh, we will have Aaron Lacey from um, Thompson Coborn. We will have um, Sherry Miller talking about the handbook, and we will also have uh, Jeannie Aki Fine talking about the changes to 5.2 in the Sarah Manual. We think this is going to be a very dynamic uh, webcast, and we hope that you'll join us. Um, 
I'm going to turn it over to Dan a little bit. How about Dan? Could you tell us a little bit about this newest podcast? That was uh, something that uh, I thought was really interesting. Maybe you can help us um, push that a little bit for folks to, to enjoy our web, our uh, podcasts. Sure. For those of you who, who enjoy getting a little listening in through the ears, um, we really recommend this most recent podcast with John Becker from VCU. Uh, this John knows state authorization. He's worked state authorization. He was my boss for a while in this, but he has a much broader knowledge of educational technology and pedagogy and other types of um, both regulatory and practice area um, information. And, and I really think you'll enjoy hearing his perspective. Um, it will it will broaden your it will broaden your knowledge base and um, he has a lot of other things that he's written as well um, so we do hope you we do hope you enjoy that as always if you have suggestions for other guests or would like to be one even if you're su suggesting yourself please please uh, please enter that onto the um, the chart there I would also now at this time like to recognize the new coordinators from July so we have from UNC Wilmington we have Amy Ostrom. From Arizona State University, we have two, Allison Hahn and Julie Greenwood. From the uni from University of Arkansas system, we have Amanda Apple. And from North Carolina Community College System Virtual Learning Community, we have Candace Holder and Katherine Davis. So welcome to all of you. And those of you, if you know any of them, please, please feel free to welcome them personally. We really hope they'll be great contributors. Um, another note for me is that I will be heading out in the next week or so on parental leave, be gone for about six weeks. So I will be missing all kinds of fun with San in the meantime. So, um, but I, I, I do uh, look forward to catching up with you all again towards the middle of September. Um, I don't know anything else, Cheryl, that I'm missing? No, but I appreciate that you shared that. I wasn't sure if, uh, if I, I should have asked you in advance if I could in, could share that, but I'm glad that you did because it's more impactful coming from you. But yes, we're very happy for Dan and glad that he can take some time um, with his family. And uh, and so if you have things that are coming up, um, please address them to me in August through mid September. And uh, we will miss Dan very much over the next few weeks, but very happy for him and his family. So um, we'll, we look forward. I look forward to being able to share with you all. Um, how they're doing during that time period. And uh, let's see, any other questions? Dan, I hope you're seeing the chat. A lot of congratulations coming your way um, from folks, so appreciate that very much. And uh, Dan, any final final thoughts? No, thank you all so much for those nice messages, though. I do I do appreciate working with such, with such warm and friendly people. So thanks, everybody. And um, we will um, see you soon. Well, Dan will see you in September. I'll see you all in August. And I want to just thank one more time our guests because this was such a wonderful session today with some really worthwhile information. It's always worthwhile, of course, but this is something that you all have, um, have expressed are real challenges. I'm glad we were able to address them with such knowledgeable folks. So thank you very much. And thank you all for being with us today. And we'll talk with you soon.